everyone. For those of you who joined, joined us uh, last month for the telehealth panel discussion, welcome again. Thank you for joining us. This afternoon, we will be talking about wearables and diagnostics through telehealth. Just some announcements before we start, if you just uh, joined us. Number one is feel free to ask questions at any time by raising your hand. Um, that's clicking a button at the bottom of your screen. And when you do that, we will go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question aloud. Otherwise, you can type in your question in the Q&A chat bubble. In the interest of time, we won't be introducing the panelists and the moderator, but we do have their bios if you click the link which is now found in the chat box. Before we start, let's start with a poll like we did the last time. Can we share the poll question? All right, so I have two questions here. One is, do you have a telehealth setup in your hospital? You can start voting now, yes, no, or not applicable. And then the second question is, do you use remote monitoring diagnostic wearables and devices in your hospital? Okay, I'm just gonna wait for everyone to get a chance to vote and we will definitely share the results with you. Ha, huh. thanks very much for participating in this. I'm just waiting for everyone to... Um... All right, five, four, three, two, one. Let's share the results. Great, so yeah, this is a good discussion. Um, quite a lot don't use remote monitoring diagnostic wearables in their hospitals yet. That's probably why you're in this panel discussion. So without further ado, let me introduce to our panelists for today. First of all, we um, have Ms. Manisha Kumar, Hospital Head and General Manager of Columbia Asia Hospitals in India. We also have Dr. Ravi Sachdev, Deputy Chief Medical Information Officer of Tan Tok Seng Hospital in Singapore. And Dr. James Yip, Group Chief Medical Information Officer of the NUHS in Singapore. And moderating our panel discussion this afternoon is Ms. Aili Xiao, Managing Director and Head of Siemens Healthineers in Singapore. Over to you, Aili. Thank you, Pinky. A very good afternoon, a warm welcome from my end as well. Welcome to this afternoon's sessions. Today, we are going to talk about the topic of wearable devices in digital healthcare uh, diagnostics. So uh, there are actually from the polling, we know that as one third of you who is familiar with the technology, uh, today we are going to find out more from our three prestigious speakers here. And uh, without any further ado, I would like to pose my first questions uh, to the lady speaker, uh, Manisha here. So Manisha, can you please share with us or the audience here in this platform what are the smart devices that uh, your hospital use and you use to send your patients home with? And how long have you been monitoring by using a wearable device in your hospital? Over yeah, to you. Thank, thank you, Aili. So we do use smart devices for remote monitoring of our patients and for diagnostics as well as reporting in a variety of places. I'll give a couple of examples here. Firstly, for inpatient care. We use a smart step-down ICU setup or a tele-ICU setup in which our patients who are more stable uh, than the intensive care unit patients but still require continuous monitoring and observation are shifted out of our regular critical care units and are remotely monitored using these smart devices. Uh, there is a central monitoring system in the hub ICU that reflects and alerts on all patient parameters uh, such as pulse, SpO2, uh, saturation, blood pressure, etc. for all these patients. And uh, this information is also available on smartphones of the caregivers of our doctors to view in real time using which they can intervene uh, uh, and make the right clinical decisions. And uh, this helps us to manage a large volume of patients as well because it essentially frees up the critical care, intensive care unit beds for us to take in a large number of patients and uh, at the same time cater to uh, the step down patients uh, in, our, in our step down ICU also with the same number of resources and the same number of doctors and nurses. And of course, the cost of treatment for the patient goes down as well. So it's a win-win both ways. And uh, as far as outpatient care is considered, uh, we use a lot of uh, 
um, wearable devices with which we send our patients home for uh, post-operative monitoring, uh, pregnancy monitoring. Uh, most uh, commonly used are for chronic uh, disease management. And uh, two examples that I can give here that we've been using um, since the last two years, and the uptake has gone up a lot in the last six months, is uh, first is uh, cardiac ambulatory wearable ECG devices that we give to our cardiovascular disease patients uh, for uh, long-term monitoring and cardiac diagnosis. Uh, this connects via Bluetooth to the smartphone and sends vital information and alerts and prompts to the relevant doctors and caregivers. Uh, on patient condition and uh, you know necessary intervention is, is is done on if the parameters exceed the threshold values. Uh, secondly, we also use uh, Bluetooth enabled uh, wearable glucose patches for our chronic diabetic patients. In some cases, smart glucometers that help uh, record transfer uh, and 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 alert. Uh, our in-house diabetes educator with useful information uh, on, on our diabetic uh, patients with which they can uh, you know, intervene, they can uh, schedule a doctor visit for the patient, they can titrate the insulin dosage for the patient uh, and so on. And lastly, I also spoke about reporting, and this is a little unique to our group. We have a teleradiology setup in our network hospitals, which consolidates all our radiology operations across uh, all the different uh, network units and hospitals. We have a hub and spoke model that links all our hospitals to a centralized uh, radiology reporting center for 24 by 7 reporting services and uh, sub-specialized uh, radiology reporting services by a centralized pool of experts that we have. We have also outsourced it in several countries in, in, in UK, Africa, Middle East, Indonesia, Southeast Asia. So today we are able to cater to and insource over 1500 radiological images per day from various centers across countries. And then again, pushed through packs and through secured servers and are reported uh, centrally by our pool of radiology experts. So just to give a few examples, these are some of the things that we are doing right now. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Uh, perhaps I would like to also channel uh, the angle back to uh, a more tertiary hospital, a general hospital, I believe, James UIOE in NUH. Can you share your example in NUH? Uh, mine are actually more direct uh, examples of uh, uh, equipment that we loan out to patients, um, they, they pay a sum with government subsidy of about $70 a month, uh, where we, we send them home with these Bluetooth-enabled devices, blood pressure sets, uh, glucometers, uh, even weighing scales, pulse oximeters. Um, and, and our experience has been that, you know, uh, there is actually a question asked by someone in the audience already, you know, how, how do you keep them, you know, uh, engaged with it? How, how do you know that they'll do what you tell them to do while they're in hospital? And uh, well, firstly, we make them pay. So that kind of works. Uh, secondly, we, we have a system where we, uh, we, we flag them. That means we'll contact them if, say, we don't get the result from them for a few days, you know, so there is a... Uh, system of monitoring where my nurses will look at the job stacks every day and say, uh, who has been non-compliant? Uh, so, so even with these measures, we have found that, you know, in our heart attack patients, when we send home with, say, a blood pressure set to titrate their, their blood pressures uh, with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers post heart attack uh, to an optimum degree post discharge, only 70% of patients are able to be, you know, compliant to, you know, just submitting their blood pressures uh, as and when you tell them to. So, so compliance is a big problem. And, and what actually helps is the human factor uh, behind this. Uh, you know, uh, in the past, we used to give them uh, cheap weighing scales. These are given to the patients as but we never got them to, you know, we tell them email us with your readings. But but making people pay, making people accountable, and um, and putting a, a a reminder, a human person behind to uh, remind them to do these readings, uh, we found that we could get 70, 80 percent. So now, now this is very person in. It, it, very personnel intensive. Uh, so now we're trying to get chat bots to take over this role of telling people just do the right thing for us. Uh, so that's been our generalized experience. Uh, we have been tele monitoring is, is immensely successful in the sense that we can get our diabetics to do this for insulin titration. And even for two months while they're on our monitoring system, uh, we're able to bring down the HbA1c by about 2%. 
And even after you stop doing this, uh, six months later, uh, we, there's still a memory effect. So the time that you took training them, uh, they, these, we still could achieve these uh, very good gains for another six more months after telemonitoring. So, so that's roughly been the experience that we've had in doing these uh, devices. Thank you for sharing. So I would like to actually touch point on the compliance itself. So we have a question from the audience, Wei Ni Ma, and she asked two questions. Uh, hope that I address it why, either uh, he or she, sir, gentlemen and ladies. So um, the, the question is about uh, the patient's compliance. Will the patients drop out? Uh, perhaps I will, I will channel these questions to Ravi yourself. Uh, how do you see the patient's compliance in this? Do they drop out somewhere in between? If they do, how long will they keep in this program with you? And how long will they drop out? And of course, uh, the next questions that are extended from this is that, is there any devices that patients do not need to do anything on that? So it is easy compliance, they just wear it, you don't need to, them to send anything. So everything is automated like what James has shared, like using chatbot and other, uh, other devices that you will be able to minimize the patient's uh, interference on that. Yeah, so over to you, Ravi. Um, your, your questions uh, actually have got multiple layers of answers and I'm going to try to address them all. Uh, first one is compliance and compliance is something that's uh, a little bit tricky to manage. It applies not just to telehealth devices, it also applies to uh, keeping appointments or to taking medications. I think uh, there are uh, various personality issues that we need to often uh, deal with, uh, as well as uh, empowering the individual to look after their own health. And to that end, I think uh, it's still a work in progress. Uh, James has, has highlighted something that we have also found, which is that if you um, charge for a service uh, and the patient is willing to pay for it, they are going to be more likely to, um, you know, fulfill their, their part of the overall process and, uh, you know, measure the parameters that are required, et cetera. Uh, that isn't a very good incentive, especially for cases where we found uh, individuals who are uh, unable to afford these devices, but definitely require remote monitoring. I think we do have some issues with that cohort, but we're still looking into how to help them. Um, the other thing that we do that's a bit different from uh, uh, what James has mentioned is that we also try to deploy devices to our community providers, uh, some of the nurses who can then go in and, and evaluate some of these patients in their homes and using these devices, transmit data back to us. So in a sense, that's also remote monitoring, but uh, it is more useful for individuals who are unable to um, perform the tasks themselves or who are unable to pay for the service uh, because they cannot afford the device. And this is one way of reaching out to them to capture the information. Uh, finally, the question about uh, that device that, uh, that does everything for them. Uh, whenever anybody brings that up, I always think of the Apple Watch and I, I don't know why I'm not endorsing them for any reason. But I think that is a holy grail, really. We are hoping that as these devices become more sophisticated, uh, one watch on the wrist is going to be able to capture all of your devices, uh, all of your parameters, including uh, non-invasive blood sugar and uh, uh, multi-lead ECG, etc., and transmit that as and when required to a clinician. Yes, we are hoping that's going to happen. At this point in time, I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, we do have some devices that can work uh, by linking up to, uh, through the internet of things, but uh, an all-in-one device is still uh, a, a short time away. Thank you. So I think to Ravi yourself, just to extend, do you face any uh, challenge in convincing your patients to uh, wear wearable devices for tracking? Absolutely. I think that there has been some uh, pushback. Um, in fact, traditionally, when we started this a good maybe eight, nine years ago, uh, we were getting pushback from not just patients, but even care providers who were saying to us that the elderly are not going to want to wear watches or tags. Uh, you know, they are not going to want to participate in all of this. And um, well, that was true to some extent, but I think we have seen that over the years, people are beginning to embrace this a little bit more. There's always going to be some pushback, but I'm glad that uh, Singapore as a whole uh, has become more tech savvy. Uh, uh, smartphone penetration has increased significantly, 
And uh, hopefully, moving forwards, we will be able to convince individuals that these are simply extensions of uh, uh, their smartphones. And if they don't need to do anything active, as you've mentioned, um, then we can just let the devices do what they need to do and transmit the data to us. The patient doesn't even need to remember that it's on. Thank you. There's an interesting question posted to Manisha. It's about the pregnancy monitoring. So you mentioned pregnancy remote monitoring. What type of monitoring is provided to your patients and how clinicians and patients are welcoming this kind of initiative? Yeah, so uh, uh, our patients and actually uh, owing to the recent COVID uh, pandemic, really in view of reducing frequent visits to the hospital, I think that has been the major incentive behind increased adoption in, in, in these kind of uh, pregnancy monitoring devices. Uh, there is remote CTG monitoring, really which uh, most of the pregnant mothers uh, have adopted. And again, this is a, a Bluetooth enabled device that uh, sends the data uh, across to the practitioner. Uh, there is also remote fetal monitoring. It's very new. Uh, we have just had one use case so far, but uh, remote fetal monitoring also has come to the market here. Uh, it is a little bit subject to regulations in India now, but uh, that is the newest uh, on the fence. And um, what was the other question? I need you to repeat the second half of the question. Or I believe about answer. the initiative. Uh, yeah. So about this initiative, how does the patients welcome this initiative? Yeah. How do they welcome the initiative? Yeah. So um, in all fairness, the uh, adoption for pregnancy monitoring was very minimal. Uh, if I would say till December last year, and I unfortunately have to credit a lot of it uh, to the pandemic situation here and. Uh, uh, not just uh, you know pregnancy monitoring, all the remote monitoring and telemedicine has has exponentially grown in uptake. If I really honestly have to say, because uh, patients don't want to visit hospitals so much, they uh, given the lockdown, they want to be at home. Uh, they they feel a little bit worried and concerned about coming inside hospital environment, and especially all the more for pregnant women. So really, here I can ascribe a lot of uptake of of this technology to the uh, COVID pandemic uh, of late but uh, i think it's here to stay i wouldn't say that it's going to vanish once it's gone and you know it will be back to square one square one where we were last year i think it's here to stay because pregnant mothers and doctors as well are seeing the benefit of this technology uh, satisfactory results and a lot of convenience uh, for the patients uh, they save costs uh, that they would have spent otherwise in doing multiple hospital visits so i think it's it's here to stay for longer uh, than the covid pandemic was so we will come back to this uh, use case again and also the motivations of using the telehealth. Uh, I would like to actually channel these questions to James again, uh, the use case prompted, and why do you decide to do this online or remotely? Um, and what is the next contact like, for example, uh, what is the good uh, outcomes and the results that you have obtained from all these use cases? Can you share more about this? Uh Yes, just simply from the blood pressure perspective, I think research has shown that, you know, when you tell someone whose blood pressure is high in clinic, uh, uh, I'm going to increase your medication, see me in three months time, we'll review it. You will need many, many, many visits before this guy's blood pressure is well controlled, especially if it's a, not a very good, high, well controlled blood pressure, you know. So uh, when we do the same protocol, except that, you, you know, you do it at home and every three days, uh, a nurse calls you and, and says, hey, can you increase the drug? Uh, that you're taking. Uh, we train our nurses with protocols. Uh, the doctors give them a certain set of medications and uh, these nurses uh, undergo a, a diploma course in telemedicine and, uh, bl uh, and blood pressure titration uh, where they increase this thing. And we found that within a month, within one month, you can get 80% of these patients to a good blood pressure level where at the beginning they were not. You know? so, so these are some of the things that you need to have to put in place uh, in order to do uh, this type of work. And you can see the benefits one year before your blood pressure gets well controlled versus one month. Uh, for patients also, of course, it's a convenience of not coming to hospital uh, to just see you for a few moments to say, I'm going to increase the drug. 
Uh, and then for patients uh, who are diabetics, you know, I, I mean, you know, every time I've got to change my dose of insulin, you know, I need to use to call, have to call somebody. And now you get a text message or phone call. Uh, and after some time, you actually learn how to do this. So, so there is a process of self, self-empowerment, you know. Uh, so on our side, the, the, the cost model, the costing model is, is to hold their hands for whatever period you think it needs uh, for them to know how it is to take care of themselves. And thereafter, we want to release these patients to self-care. They can still do the monitoring themselves. Uh, we move to a more passive form of uh, uh, remote monitoring, which means uh, they will decide when they want to submit the results. They are taking care of themselves, but they're just letting me know roughly how they're doing. And so when we review them in clinic, we see their results. But you know, when during the passive phase, uh, we say that we are no longer responsible for your results. Uh, you are on your own, and then there are disclaimers in the system. I think there are some questions. One from a friend, uh, Dr. Sandhya, who is asking, you know, how do you how do you take care of funny results that come out you know, from your wearables? You know, high blood pressure, high glu- glucose. Uh, so we we have to make them sign a disclaimer, you know, to tell them when uh, operating hours. Uh, so for me, it's Monday to Friday office hours. Saturday and Sunday, please don't submit any results to us. So that's in the disclaimer kind of thing. Uh, then in terms of the way we review these results, yes, the IT system, the back end is able to screen for critical results and inform somebody to take care of it. You know? But obviously, we don't want to be watching our phones or emails all the time to take care of these things. So you've got to tell the patient uh, there is a role that you have to do for yourself. Uh, and we also educate them what to do when they have got these you know, highs or very low uh, pressures or high or low sugars. So, so those are the backup education that you have to do in order to get the use case right. Thank you. We have also answered a very relevant questions about the review of the results. I would like to actually also extend this review of the results to uh, Ravi yourself as well. How do you handle the review of the results? I think on top of what James has shared on the NUH site, and also from the Tanto Singh side, can you share your experience of the review of the result? And how critical is the result? Do you uh, segregate your result into a different timely manner? How you review it based on the urgency and other categories that you have done with the result? Thank you. Um, I don't think our process is uh, significantly different from what James has already described. Effectively, uh, We do not run a 24 by 7 service at this point in time uh, because uh, it is not something that's feasible. Um, As as James says, we can't keep looking at our devices to evaluate if uh, an abnormal result is going to come in and we need to act on it immediately. So there are a couple of things that we do. We've got um, a protocol in place for the system to be able to Uh, highlight to us when results fall outside of uh, a defined normal range. And that range can be defined at the patient level. Uh, Doesn't have to be at the entire cohort level. So each patient can have their own ranges that we would want to look out for. Whenever these uh, results are abnormal, then this uh, uh, will be highlighted to our nurses, but not in the form of an urgent text message at midnight. Rather, it would come into the inbox, uh, something to be reviewed during uh, the uh, uh, appropriate uh, hours of monitoring. Uh, At the same time, as James has also alluded to, we have to make sure that the patients are aware of what they should do when they do find uh, an abnormal result. And it is after uh, or outside of the hours where we provide services. Uh, And uh, standard uh, um, advice would include contacting your nearest uh, clinical provider, or attending the emergency department if you have any concerns. I think, I think those things are not going to go away. Um, uh, introducing chatbots often can actually help to alleviate a lot of uh, um, uh, anxiety over results which may be flagged as abnormal, but actually are not dangerous in any way. And I think that is something that we are also exploring and hoping to roll out uh, in a larger way because that will help to then, uh, in a sense, triage some of these results and uh, uh, then truly just highlight those that require urgent attention uh, um, as opposed to those who are, you know, just outside the, barely outside the range of normality. Yeah. Thank you. I have one question here from the floor. I think it's best posted to Manisha because of uh, some of the use case that you have shared earlier on. 
So from your opinion, which of the top three remote monitoring use cases that you will recommend a clinic to start that have highest traction? Uh, so uh, for a clinic, uh, so I understand the question is for an outpatient uh, setting alone and not for a hospital. Um, for an outpatient setting, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, relevance of uh, chronic disease management. Um, uh, that is something we do in hospitals as well, but uh, for all, all chronic disease patients, uh, diabetic, uh, hypertensive, I think uh, there is a lot of value um, in uh, continuous monitoring uh, devices uh, that uh, not just uh, helps the uh, you know the caregiver or the practitioner to uh, enable continuity of care and to really be able to um, ensure that the, the the prognosis the diagnosis and treatment pathway is correct but also makes the visits with the patients more meaningful and again coming from an indian context i think here uh, what we battle with more is uh, fewer number of doctors per thousand population and you know fewer number of clinics and really time of the doc clinician is of the essence number of clinicians as well so the the better we can utilize the time or spent in OPD in, in interaction uh, with the patient the more meaningful we can make each and every visit uh, uh, the better it is for the patient as well as uh, as well as the clinician and uh, I think it is not very difficult I think both the other panelists have talked about monetization um, the cost of uh, this uh, you know wearable device to be passed to the patient also makes uh, 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 you know a sense from a cost benefit analysis point of view for the patient because the the money saved in frequent OPD visits to see the clinician will more than make up for the additional amount that he or she is spending in, 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 in buying this uh, technology and carrying on and um, be, be it a one-time cost or a monthly subscription. So I think from all points of view for chronic disease management, uh, it is best advisable for outpatient clinics uh, to use uh, remote monitoring devices. Touch base on the cost. There's a question raised on the cost itself, especially for uh, less privileged uh, groups, for example, like the elderly or the lower social economic strata. And uh, maybe these patients, they are less tech savvy if you want them to afford a certain variable devices and then subsequently monitor them. Uh, how do you make sure that, uh, that you will be able to include them of uh, of this program and how can these uh, costs be taken care of? Uh, I would like to actually channel these questions to James. Uh, one of the things we do before we deploy these devices is that we make our patients pass a test. So we actually set the test and, and the test will be the ability to use and demonstrate the use of this equipment before they bring it home. So before we charge them actually. Um, so we, we have, uh, different types of systems. So there are those that require a, a, a smartphone or tablet that's associated by Bluetooth to a device, uh, which the elderly basically cannot handle very well. So we, we've started deploying uh, from the very beginning uh, these uh, what we call gateways. And all you need to do, the gateway can be a phone, a, a smartphone that you don't do anything with. You just plug in the power, that's it. Uh, so they know how to plug a smartphone, the power, and that's all they need to do. And then a Bluetooth device that you press one button. So I, I call this the mother-in-law test, uh, which is if my mother-in-law who does not speak a word of English can uh, press, turn on a switch and press a button, uh, they can do this workflow. That, that's all we insist that they do. Uh, then of course, there are the, the patients who are poor, uh, but they may have a handphone. And, and some of these patients, uh, we actually donate these not smart, not, not smart blood pressure sets, but normal blood pressure sets where they can then key it in to their, their, their phones. And then we can actually look at these results as well. So, so I, I think, you know, you, you can look at the continuum of care and, and say, depending on what uh, group of patients you have, you have a, you know, a high tech device with a, a chat bot and things like that for a certain group that you know will respond to chat book. Bots. But if you give that to the elderly, it's absolutely useless. So you need to keep your technology simple. You need to keep it affordable to what people can use. So, um, you, you know, you need to give them a system that they can manage themselves at the cost that they can afford in order to do the care that you need 
So I, I would say that that is the lesson. You have to tailor. It's not one system for all. Yeah, so I would like to actually also uh, try to experiment audio questions in this webinar as well. So if you do want to actually ask your questions in an audio format, please raise your hand and our editors will then put you uh, live on the uh, webinar as well so that you can speak out your questions. Without any further ado, I will still continue with the questions posted uh, in text format. Uh, the next questions I would like to address uh, to Ravi, it is about the compliance and the regulatories on the usage of the wearables uh, in your setting. Generally, you have a general wearable devices like your Fitbit and like your Apple phones and so on. Uh, and also you have devices that is a medical devices termed by different regulatory categories. How do you handle them and how do you ensure that the accuracy of the data, be it uh, 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 results from a generic devices or medical devices, uh, serve the purpose of the case that you want to use in your clinical setting. Thank you. Again, I think we are currently using uh, a mixture of these de devices. As you mentioned, there are some consumer level devices which uh, we can actually use for basic monitoring. For example, a lot of our patients have got Fitbits or other types of uh, pedometers. We don't need to have a medical grade pedometer in order to ensure that uh, that individual is actually you know, performing some sort of physical activity on a regular basis. However, things like uh, uh, ECG monitoring or blood sugar monitoring, we wanna make sure that the devices that they use are, as you say, calibrated, that they're accurate, and that they have a, a um, uh, or that, that we have a, a means of ensuring that the data that we receive from them uh, is trustable. So for that to happen, obviously these devices need to be uh, regulated uh, and approved by the uh, HSA, uh, Health Sciences Authority in Singapore, in the same way that these devices would be approved by, let's say, CE or uh, the FDA in, in the US. So, so I think any medical grade device does need to have this sort of uh, approval and uh, a remote device which performs the same task should also undergo this sort of approval. At the same time, a number of these devices when they do come to our shores have already been used in different settings around the world and often one can find published literature that talks about things like uh, accuracy and validity of the data in different settings and we can use that as a reliable gauge as to whether this is something that we might want to consider in our own setting as well. But most important of all, in order to, co to convince our clinicians to adopt a new, uh, um, a new device, a new technology, we would have to do some sort of internal validation and testing uh, and then demonstrate that the data that we receive falls within an acceptable error margin uh, and at the same time is uh, data that's reproducible and can be um, used for clinical decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ravi. Uh, can we actually bring this channel back to uh, India, to Manisha, uh, over to you on the setting and the regulatory compliances and the requirements in India? Can you actually share to the setting in India? Manisha, please unmute yourself. Yes. The regulatory framework in India actually um, covers the principles of medical ethics, uh, including doctor patient confidentiality, uh, it stresses on protection of patient privacy and data privacy, and clearly states that patient data only belongs to the patient, not to the provider. So we strictly operate uh, on this premise as well and we have uh, for all the patient records that we hold in the hospital we have put ironclad protocols to ensure data security of all the ehr or patient health records um, uh, we are also investing a lot towards external audits and uh, and, and validations 
Um, there is a high trust audit, uh, which is high trust is, a, is one of the global authorities in auditing and certifying data security practices across the world. So we're, we're gearing up and investing towards getting that certification done uh, for our hospital as well. But uh, um, working with external vendors and uh, you know external remote uh, monitoring device companies, uh, there is a risk of a breach. Definitely, that is a concern in our mind. Um, we try our best to work with FDA or DGC approved products uh, that are comply that, that comply with HIPAA guidelines, that is seven guidelines of data security. Um, but uh, the fact is that in India, few companies are able to observe all these guidelines. Uh, you know, a handful of them get third party audits um, uh, to vet and validate their sec data security mechanisms inside the, what they are following in their companies. So while we have uh, legal agreements and we have non-disclosure agreements in place with them, uh, this is still a point of concern that we face uh, in, in, in working with the uh, companies, third-party companies. Thank you. Uh, there are, while you are speaking, there are several questions pop up for the uh, data security and also the data privacy uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how this uh, is being managed. And it is obviously a very big topic in the industry, especially the healthcare industry now. Uh, I would like to actually start this with, uh, this is a very challenging question. Perhaps uh, James, would you like to take it on the data privacy security and how this is being handled? Yeah, uh, you got to look at it from the framework by which, you know, these patients are giving you this data, you know. So, so firstly, if it's a consumer-based de device, you know, own standalone platform companies, which, uh, you know, house all the data in their own, uh, you know, data warehouses. And, and then, uh, then the hospital or the doctor is just a secondary use of data, you know. So we're just a data intermediary uh, that the patient allows. So if, if the framework is like that, an example, uh, pacemakers, you know. So a lot of these smart pacemakers are, uh, from whichever pacemaker company, uh, they have their own proprietary set of you know telemedicine systems, you know which uh, they control. I, I have absolutely no control. Uh, so in those cases, we make sure that the legal framework is that uh, patient and company using these. Uh, uh, you sign off your disclaimers with one another, uh, but you give me access. So patient signs responsibility to give doctor access to their information as. A secondary uh, 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 person, so so I, I'm not responsible if that data is uh, is hacked from that database by this consumer company. Uh, but I get the data by patient's permission to do things that I need to do. So that's one framework. Uh, secondly, if, if this is something deployed by the hospital, uh, then that's a bit more tricky. So then you have cybersecurity and data privacy issues. Uh, so at least in my hospital, when we are responsible for these things, we make sure that firstly no personal data is transmitting from these wearables uh, to my place. So we normally use a device ID. Uh, this device ID is unique to the patient. Uh, when that data traverses the internet through my firewalls, we reassociate that patient, the device ID with a patient name, and then, uh, then the doctor can see and use this thing. Uh, so you gotta make sure that uh, from the cybersecurity and the personal data protection side that you, know, you observe these things. So patient's data will not be intercepted while on the internet can only be aggregated while in the hospital firewalls. Doctor can see these data points. And of course, you are responsible for all this from the legal standpoint. Uh, so these are the things that you, you, you do need to watch, uh, you know, especially if there are portals that you create uh, that allow patients to give you data. So when they give you data, you have to look at the legal framework in your country to say what is permissible, what are you responsible, responsible for and uh, what are you liable for if, if say you don't act on the results. So I, I would say that's a very high level picture of what you should do for these devices. So coming to this, uh, the, the choice of the variable devices and the uh, considerations that you will take in the evaluations of these devices, uh, beside the data security and so on, any other considerations that you would take uh, when you actually choose the variable devices uh, to then extend it to the patients? Perhaps I want to actually uh, extend this to Ravi on extensions to what James has shared earlier on. Any other considerations in choosing these devices?
sorry. Uh, yeah. I, I thought I thought I did I did unmute myself. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I I I think that that's a, a it's a good question, and there are actually a number of things that we would uh, look at when deciding on uh, which device to use. But I think we start with the basics. Uh, a device that already has been validated, uh, that has got sufficient data to demonstrate that it is accurate and uh, the data that uh, uh, the information that it provides is reproducible and uh, clinically usable. Um, cost is always uh, one of the issues as well. We want to have not just one device, but several devices within each category across different price ranges so that we can uh, provide these devices to different uh, categories of patients based on their ability to pay for the service. Um, integration uh, of the, the data from that device into our electronic medical records is something else that we are always on the lookout for. Obviously, we don't want to double document or to uh, have to capture data manually and then find some way of putting that into the patient's record. Uh, usability from the patient's perspective, you know, something that's quick and easy or, or even a uh, best case scenario is that it's uh, uh, something that the patient doesn't need to do anything at all other than just put it on, for example, right? Uh, but usability also extends to the clinicians. Uh, you know, if they have to use the device it's as well uh, when they are engaged with the patient, or if they need to be the ones to help to troubleshoot the patient in a clinical situation, they also need to obviously have some ability to manage that, as well as how they're going to interpret the data that comes through um, and how they're going to be able to use that data. It, there's no real value in a device that provides a whole host of data through a clinician who doesn't know what to do with that information. And I think that is something that needs to be thought through before uh, um, remote monitoring is implemented. I think we are uh, in the age of big data and I always am on the uh, um, side of trying to capture as much data as possible uh, about any of our patients because it's, it's by analyzing this big data that we truly pick up patterns that can help us to predict things like falls, for example. But at the same time, you need to know how to analyze this data. And you also need to define what you're going to capture this data as, as in, you know, what, what are the parameters around which this data is going to be viewed and how it's going to be interpreted. Um, so these are some of the considerations. One more, I would say maybe is language. Uh, uh, we're, we're living in a, a, a multicultural um, country and uh, it is important that uh, um, the data, uh, the, the devices are something that can be understood by the patient or client so that they know what to do next. It, it's no real point if they can't speak the language and therefore the device becomes uh, inaccessible. Yeah, thank you for the good sharing. Uh, can I also pose one question? Uh, this is actually coming back to the earlier on on the use case itself because just now we mentioned a lot about the diabetes, cardiac cases as well as the pregnancy case. There's one um, question here to ask is, how do you see this technology benefiting the cancer patients group? Especially the treatment journey is long yeah, for cancer group and you will need to address both the chemo treatments as well as radiotherapy treatments on these patients. Any use case for telehealth on these patients group? Um, perhaps uh, I would like to channel this to uh, Manisha because you seem to use it a lot for a different idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, oncology, I mean, of course, we have uh, used uh, remote monitoring devices for palliative care, uh, for, for, for terminal patient care, uh, and uh, really holistic uh, home care for bedridden patients and terminally, terminally ill patients. Uh, who don't uh, um, who, who just want to be at palliative care or at home care and don't don't want to come back uh, to the hospital and uh, out of uh, the uh, you know the chronic um, uh, monitoring devices chronic disease monitoring devices that I mentioned not specifically those but I think in in terms of cancer patients um, a more holistic picture is needed uh, by the consultant and uh, uh, what we have used major D in a for oncology and cancer patients is, is home care and palliative care uh, so far. And uh, those are the use cases that we have in our hospitals. Thank you for sharing. 
Yeah, there's some questions posted about uh, big data management. So obviously by generating such a huge data, you have a huge database. So how do you then further crunch the data? So is there any uh, example that this data can be then used uh, for mach deep machine learning? For example, helping you to understand the disease better into trending or into some predictive studies on that. Uh, can I actually uh, invite James to address this? Yeah, I, I guess this is the promise of big data to be able to do things. But but actually, your remote monitoring data is not really big data, like, you know. So <laughs> it's just one parameter. Or so uh, I, I, we have done big data work where we connected whole ICUs, ICU with respirators, blood pressure, ECG, um, every perimeter into a AI system. Uh, you know, you can look at ICU scores like uh, SOFA scores or uh, uh, and, 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 and we have done that, you know, we give an app to uh, uh, a doctor and then I, I call this the crystal ball software, you know, so you turn it on at the beginning of your shift and it tells you in the next 12 hours who's going to die or who's going to get worse, who's going to get better. Uh, we have found that the junior doctors appreciate this because when they come on, they, they know who to look out for. Uh, senior doctors never trust AI, um, you know, they think they're the best. So, so we've, we've shown that these systems are kind of useful in terms of predicting outcomes because in ICUs, when you're getting all this huge data coming in, uh, you are able to see what happens actually after 12 hours. So the machine actually learns, I predict 12 hours ahead and 12 hours have passed, I see whether it's really occurred. And we can actually draw our coefficient line across and say, yeah, yeah, it's accurate. And the machine actually gets smarter with time. You know, first six months we used it, uh, it was quite clever. Uh, another six months passed when we used it, it got even clever. So, uh, so uh, but then again, you know, can you, you know, what is your use case for using this? Is it acceptable to your doctors? Uh, that is... An, another uh, an, an, another problem that you want to do. So we've done that in the past, and uh, yes, we've, we've shown that it works, uh, but we've also shown that clinicians don't like it. <laughs> yes. I, I was about like to ask, how does this contribute to the patient's journey? Uh, so same it, it, to you, James. It, it worked for me because, you know, I look at this patient, sometimes I, I'm not sure, you know, do I send this patient out of ICU? So when I look at it, it says, when I'm 50-50, I ask the machine. Then the machine says, oh, this guy is going to get better. And then I, I send him out of ICU. But the next day, I will call up the ward and ask, oh, what happened to this patient? You know, so, uh, so in that sense, it works. Uh, there are some times, you know, I, I wonder, should I escalate antibiotics in the ICU? Uh, and look, oh, he's going to get better anyway. Uh, but what we've learned is that the machine also learns human behavior. The machine learns that, you know, when the BP is low, the next day it will get better because you will start inotropes. So the machine has also learned your human intervention to what actually happens in ICU. So that's also kind of interesting. So obviously you mentioned that variable data are just part of the data contributed to this whole big data. And obviously there might be some point of time that you will integrate this data into your hospital system, be it your HIS system or be it just part of the data analytics that you want. So how do you uh, integrate this data to your own hospital database? Uh, can Ravi you take these questions? Yeah, so I think that is something that we definitely want to have uh, as an endpoint, uh, the ability to pull in robust and trustable data from an external source about a patient so we can have a, a complete picture of what's going on. Uh, at this point in time, I think we are still working on a solution that allows that. And th there are a few aspects of this. Number one is firstly, the data must be transmitted in a particular format. And I think Manisha mentioned this previously. Uh, we use HL7 as uh, basically the uh, language uh, uh, by which uh, a device is able to send data across to electronic medical record systems that can recognize it and put it into the appropriate fields. So, so uh, I think from a technical perspective, it's not that difficult. There are also a number of vendors today that have uh, integration software and, and uh, allow you to link up a whole host of different devices to one system uh, and translate that for you so that it can be utilized in clinical care. Uh, at the same time, we would also only want to do that if we are 
more or less sure that that information is reliable. One of the issues with remote monitoring, obviously, is that potentially anyone could pick up a device and just use it. And that data flows into the account of the individual who's registered on that device. And you don't want wrong data in someone's record. So I think some of these things still need to be resolved. Um, and I don't think that those are technical resolutions. They, they are, they're practical things that we have to look into, uh, but I'm sure we will get there eventually. So from a technical perspective, yes, it can be done. We just need to make sure that the data comes in appropriately and that we're able to uh, trust it. Thank you. It's happened to me. My patient was 60 kilos, then was 15 kilos the next day. <laughs> the, the sun stepped on the wing, smart wing scale and transmitted to us. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice use case. Then you start all your investigations. <laughs> okay, so now we are in the midst of the COVID pandemic. I would like to actually quickly touch, touch, touch base on this topic. Any creative idea or the use case of the telehealth in uh, COVID uh, pandemic or COVID situation? How do you use this technology uh, to Manisha? Um, yeah, so uh, during COVID time, of course, to maintain continuity of care for our patients throughout the lockdowns and quarantines, we've uh, adopted and we have leveraged uh, telemedicine. So we've connected with our patients extensively through video consultations. We've done online prescriptions and home delivery of medicines. We've done home health checks, home physiotherapy, rehabilitation, so what have you. So pretty much uh, looking at the entire outpatient ecosystem of hospital, and seeing how we can seamlessly implant the same in the patient's home. Um, well, telemedicine has been around for quite some time in our country as well, but the uptake both from the patients as well as from the clinician side has exponentially increased now because of the pandemic situation. And we've also seen increased usage of wearables, uh, you know, all the wearables for chronic disease management. Uh, we talked about a couple of pregnancy monitoring, et cetera, already uh, that helps reduce patients' visits to the hospital. We have also managed patients who are afflicted with COVID and we are continuously man uh, managing them uh, as I speak. Uh, with mild and moderate uh, COVID conditions in their home quarantines and in COVID care centers, which are not hospitals. And uh, we are doing this through extensive remote monitoring. Uh, we are using, uh, you know, smart devices, smart pulse oximeters, blood pressure monitors and devices that are temperature, uh, that are transmitting temperature, pulse saturation, blood pressure and all this information back to our uh, nurses and doctors in the hospital. And uh, this is ensuring that we are able to manage larger and larger number of COVID patients uh, without having all of them to be in the hospital or queued up for hospital beds. So this is something that we're doing now is, is innovative, is breakthrough, especially in Indian scenario. And and at this scale and level has not been done before. Uh, there are also remote respiratory monitoring devices that are being used. Uh, I'm not using in my hospital here, but I'm aware of a couple of hospitals who are using remote respiratory uh, monitoring devices also uh, to manage patients inside the hospital itself. Uh, so you don't, uh, they don't need to deputy nurses or uh, uh, respiratory therapists or doctors on the bedside, and they're able to handle larger number of COVID patients by means of these, uh, these devices. So I think um, uh, these are some of the innovative uh, approaches that we've taken and COVID scenario has encouraged us to adopt it, the case, see the case use, a lot of proof of concept of the viability of these solutions is there, benefits of these solutions is there and therefore a lot of apprehensions of doctors and patients have gotten cleared out as a result of this and a lot of bottlenecks uh, which existed in terms of these apprehensions have also gotten removed. Yeah, that's very true. Thank you for sharing. Okay, we are coming to the end. We have actually five minutes left uh, to our sessions today. I would like to pose my last questions to the three speakers here. Can you please answer in one minute yeah, uh, these questions? What is the future of telehealth? What's next? Uh, perhaps I'll start with uh, Ravi yourself. Thank you. Uh, I think telehealth has a, a bright future. Uh, people are beginning to recognize that a lot of things can be done without having to step into a hospital or a clinic. And by people, I mean not just patients, I also mean providers. Um, so yes, I think that this is something that will continue. Uh, but it, in order for, for this to become uh, even more useful, it needs to be more accurate. 
uh, or at least at the level of the device. And at the same time, I think somebody asked this question very early on, and I would agree with that. It needs to be something that does not require active participation by the patient. If they can just you know, apply something and forget about it, let the data flow, uh, and at the same time be accessible either via mobile uh, um, or some other platform so that they, they are aware of uh, what's happening to the body, I think that will allow them to be able to manage themselves without having to worry about you know, taking a blood pressure reading or a blood sugar reading uh, at fixed times. Yep, sounds good to me. Uh, we should continue using telehealth. Thank you. Thank you. To Manisha. Uh, yeah, as I just uh, was mentioning that much of the technological enablements in healthcare that we're seeing now are here to stay and uh, they'll only grow. Uh, there is greater demand for home care, uh, managing healthcare at home through telemedicine, remote monitoring. And uh, I see a lot more demand for point of care testing going forward for uh, AI based diagnostics uh, and also in the midst of all this, you know, cloud based storage of patient records and really integration of patient information inside and outside the hospital, because now we'll be talking of two ecosystems. So one is, and I think uh, Dr. Ravi, earlier Dr. James also mentioned the, you know, the whole piece of integrating with HIS, uh, the various platforms and you know, data storage on hospital HISs. But I think this is going to grow uh, increasingly and really unified cloud-based uh, patient health records is going to be uh, you know, what's going to come up. And uh, it will be very crucial for integrating Integrating uh, patient information on one roof. And I think uh, from a hospital point of view, I see a lot of outpatient ecosystem uh, infrastructurally moving out of the hospitals, uh, more toward telemedicine home service like setup, which is more, both cheaper for the patients, convenient for the patients, and increases reach for the hospitals and doctors. Uh, there is a, a huge dearth of hospital beds, and we have seen unprecedented uh, need for hospital beds and critical care beds uh, now in the pandemic. And it's exposed the world to the fact that uh, how less of critical care infrastructure we really have. So I see more of tele ICU, e ICU setups coming and coming up in future, and a lot more remote monitoring devices uh, to be used to cater to larger number of patients inside the hospital, and really stratifying uh, between sick and uh, uh, and 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 uh, you know another set of patients who can uh, be monitored using uh, this technology. So a lot of trends that we see now, uh, a lot of innovative models that we see now will continue, will grow forward uh, in a more smart, perhaps more cohesive and a more pervasive manner going forward. Thank you. Over to you, James. The, the future is bright for telehealth uh, and COVID has been a cha game changer. Uh, my own hospital has set a target of 30% of teleconsultations for repeat patients as the future. That means all of us have to try to turn some of our visit. Uh, and then you've got to learn how to monetize it as well. So if you do it for free, then, uh, then you're wasting your time doing this. Uh, but from the patient perspective, uh, there are a few things, uh, the, the patient perspective, the provider perspective, and for the device and telehealth company perspective, uh, there are hard times ahead. Uh, and, and the reason is, is, is this, the patient will ask themselves, what is in, in it for me to keep doing this for you? Uh, and then the hospitals and the healthcare system have to, to give that value proposition. Is this to improve your health? Is this to be a nuisance busybody to harass you every day to submit the blood pressure? So, so these are the ones that, uh, these are the questions that you have to ask and it's very delicate to see what is the benefits to the patient. And lastly, of course, to the technology companies, I've seen many failed technology companies trying with a brilliant idea coming in with a device that probably you know, is of some use, uh, but then in, you know, in a matter of one to two years, the next device comes in and then the next device comes in and the next device comes in again. So you know, do we have to keep changing our platforms in order to support all these new devices? So I, I looked at, at the fact that we now have a lot of work to do in terms of standards. We have a Bluetooth standard, and is there a standard gateway for the data to come into the systems, in the hospital systems? Is it going to be a national one? Is it a hospital system one? So these are the questions that need to be answered. If you develop a proprietary standard, then no one can use your platform, no matter how good it is, and then it will die. So, so the road is, is, is rosy for telehealth, 
uh, but the road is also hard for telehealth because of the need to standardize, to, uh, to look at platforms, look at standards, to look at cybersecurity and information risk. Uh, so with that, thank you so much. Thank you very much for all your valuable inputs and insights. We can go on this topic for hours, but our time has come to five o'clock now. Uh, thank you for joining us. I would like now to hand over back to our host, uh, to Pinky. Thank you, Long. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aili. Thank you, um, Manish. Thank Manisha. Thank you, Dr. James and Dr. Ravi for uh, the wonderful discussion. And thank you to all attendees. Before you go, though, um, let me do a quick poll, just a very quick one. Please don't leave yet. Um, can we share the poll? Okay, so what is your one biggest next step? You've heard all of those things. We want to know where you're at. Um, are you still setting up a telehealth platform? Know what device is available? Need to justify the cost to management, maybe? Or maybe you're at the point where you're trying to convince your clinicians and your patients in the hospital to use them, or you're not thinking about this yet. Okay, while you're answering this poll, we won't be sharing the results. We will be sharing it in a report. Thank you for joining us. Please join us again in August. I think it's August 27th. We're going to then talk about command centers for the healthcare. So thank you once again and see you all on August 27th for command center. I hope this was um, one hour well spent with us. Thank you. <laughs>